Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Vinay and I'm a, a fellow at the Bangalore Skull Base Institute. Today I'm going to be talking about neoplasms of the temporal bone. Uh, these neoplasms of the temporal bone are very difficult to tackle because they are uh, placed in one of the most inaccessible areas of the temporal of the body, which is the temporal bone. And for a good management of these lesions, we need a cohesive skull-based team. And we have to give a lot of importance to preoperative assessment, planning, and surgical ex execution. And this often requires the expertise of an auto otolaryngologist or a neuroautologist, a neurosurgeon, neuroradiologist, interventional arteriographer, anesthesiologist, and a reconstructive surgeon. So there are a variety of histological types of tumors of the temporal bone and difficult surgical approaches with a high risk of neurological deficit. So in, this, in these cases, knowledge of the particular tumor biology and meticulous preoperative planning facilitates the appropriate surgical approach and successful outcomes in these cases. So these are a huge list of uh, temporal bone neoplasms. I'll be going through the most important and the most commonly encountered ones. Before that, how do you evaluate skull-based lesions? So an accurate diagnosis and evaluation of the extent is very important. And this can be done by a thorough physical examination, audiological examination, vestibular and radiological examination. Hirsch and Curtin noted that MRI and CT are complementary and not competitive in nature in the uh, initial evaluation of skull-based lesions. So both M uh, CT and MRI have a very important role to play. CT shows the uh, bony involvement and MRI uh, mainly shows the soft tissue involvement in these lesions. So surgical approach depends on whether the lesion is benign or malignant. And it is also important to differentiate from vascular anomalies. Benign lesions in the middle ear space whose boundaries are clearly visible through the tympanic membrane can be removed uh, just through the external artery canal. Uh, benign tumors limited to the mesotympanum with non-visible borders through the tympanic membrane can be approached through a combined transcanal and facial nerve, facial recess or through an extended facial recess approach. So depending on the extent and site of the lesion, the uh, approach can be modified and extended. Malignancies are best removed on block, whereas benign lesions can be removed peacefully. Surgical approaches to the lesion uh, deeper within the temporal bone can be chosen either to provide adequate exposure for complete excision, to allow easy access to an exteriorized cavity, to preserve useful residual hearing if possible, and whenever possible, the facial nerve and other cranial nerves should also be uh, preserved, to try to avoid injury to the brainstem and the internal carotid artery, and to provide for wound closure without any CSF leak. Some of the commonly encountered benign tumors of the temporal bone are glomus or paragangliomas, uh, granulomas and uh, dystrophies, which include histiocytomas, eosinophilic granulomas, fibrous dysplasia, and Paget's disease. Neural tumors such as neuromas and schwannomas, mesenchymal tumors, which include bone cartilaginous tumors, lipoma, hemangioma, teratoma, and others. There are also few adenomas, such as endolymphatic sac tumors and ectopic tissues, which are quite rare. Glomus tympanicum is a very commonly encountered uh, temporal bone lesion. They are benign and slow growing tumors and after acoustic neuroma, uh, glomus tympanicum is the most commonly encountered tumor. Uh, these are non uh, chromaffin uh, paragangliomas. They lack uh, positive response to chromaffin staining associated with neural crest tumors of the adrenal gland. They arise from uh, branchiomeric uh, uh, paraganglia distributed along the course of the autonomic nerves from the skull base to the aortic arch. So these typically occur along the course of uh, major vasculature and autonomic nerves. So incidence is approximately 1 is to 13 lakh and it has a female preponderance, uh, 4 is to 1 ratio uh, among females. And the median age of presentation is quite late, 50 to 60 years, and there is no ethnic uh, predilection. Uh, some studies have shown that this may be auto autosomal dominant. It has a malignancy rate of less than 5%. And uh, the term glomus is usually a misnomer. Nowadays, jugulotympanic paraganglioma is a preferred uh, term. So jugulotympanic uh, paragangliomas are ovoid lobulated structures measuring about 0 0.1 millimeter to 1.5 millimeter in diameter. However, long-standing uh, uh, tumors can uh, 
uh, exceed this uh, diameter as well. And they are mainly vascularized by the inferior tympanic branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery. So it is very important early in the surgery to cauterize this uh, feeder vessel. And on average, there are three per side and they are found in, associated, uh, in uh, association with Jacobson's and Arnold's nerves. These nerves are known to occur in associate, uh, uh, tumors which are uh, known to occur in association with uh, tympano uh, jugular and uh, tympano uh, mastoid uh, paragangliomas include pheochromocytoma, thyroid neoplasms and parathyroid adenomas. About 10% of these lesions are multicentric and the most common combination is a carotid body tumor with an ipsilateral uh, glomus uh, tympanicum or a glomus jugular tumor. There are two main staging systems which are used. The fish staging system, which is very common, and it has the same system for uh, glomus tympanicum and jugular, and Glasscock-Jackson uh, system of classification, which has two separate classification systems. The most commonly used is the fish classification. In this uh, class A consists of uh, tumors which are confined to the middle of left and strictly to the promontory. Class B uh, includes tumors which uh, extend to the tympanomastoid area with no involvement of the infralabyrinthine compartments. In class C, the tumor in the uh, infralabyrinthine compartment and extends into the petrous apex. And according to the involvement of the carotid, C1 is carotid foramen, C2 is vertical segment of the carotid canal, C3 is horizontal segment of the carotid canal, and C4 is foramen lacerum and cavernous sinus. In class D, there is a dural involvement so if it's extra dural, then it's DE1. And uh, in DE1, it's a, uh, intracranial extra dural extension of less than two centimeter. And in DE2, it is more than two centimeter. In intradural uh, tumors, there is intracranial uh, intradural extension of less than two centimeter, which come under DI1. And if it's more than two centimeter extension, it comes under DI2. Uh, on clinical examination, uh, through an otoscope, you can see blanching of the white mass with uh, positive uh, pneumatoscopy or segalization. So that is a very characteristic diagnostic uh, test to uh, in case of tympanomastoid paragangliomas. Coming to the evaluation, a full audiogram with tympanometry has to be done. Fine cut CT of the temporal bone with contrast to evaluate bone erosion relationship to uh, seventh cranial nerve, cochlear, and internal carotid artery. MRI to evaluate intracranial and intradural extension and further define soft tissue relationships. And four vessel arteriography to evaluate multicentricity, the feeding vessels, embolization, and the internal carotid artery. FNAC is generally not advised in these tumors because of the chance uh, or the risk of uh, profuse bleeding. Management is mainly through surgical management and sometimes uh, radiotherapy or uh, gamma knife therapy is advised. If it is limited to the mesotympanum and the hypotympanum without involvement of the jugular pulp, then transcanal tympanotomy with avulsion is uh, enough to clear the disease. Larger tumors that extend into the mastoid, which is uh, type 2 to 4, uh, need a transmastoid approach with external facial recess approach along with canal wall down mastoidectomy, depending on the extent and location of the tumor. Even further tumors that extend beyond the middle ear or involved jugular bulb are approached like glomus jugular tumors. So this is one uh, interesting case which was uh, recently operated uh, by Dr. Sampath. And as you can see here, uh, in the uh, there is a big uh, soft tissue density here in the middle ear on the left side. So this was diagnosed to be glomus tympanicum. So this is a pre-operative uh, facial nerve examination. You can see that the facial nerve is quite intact. This is a 38-year-old uh, female patient who came with a history of uh, tinnitus and a bloody discharge from the ear and also decreased hearing over the last uh, six months. And you can three, see here through the speculum, there is a very uh, angry looking tumor in the middle ear, very characteristic of glomus. So this is how the initial incision is taken, about two finger breaths posterior to the pinna. And a cortical mastoidectomy was done. You can see a very wide cortical mastoidectomy here. And the uh, facial recess approach is being done here. And once we enter the middle ear, you can see this tumor 
very clearly, completely filling the middle ear. And after the tumor was debulked, you can also see the ossicular chain is quite intact. This is the incus here. This is the stapes. This is the stapedial tendon, which you can see. And there's also tumor going between the crura. This is uh, the facial rhesus approach. You can see the facial rhesus very clearly here. This is the incus buttress. This is the cora tympani and the, horizontal, uh, the vertical portion of the facial nerve here. And you can see the uh, middle ear through the facial rhesus. The tumor was completely cauterized. The feeder vessel uh, was uh, cauterized early on and the tumor was completely debulled. And reconstruction was done with cartilage and temporalis fascia graft was placed. And the wound was sutured completely. And this is the post-operative scan. You can see the tumor has been completely removed. And the post-operative patient of examination uh, looks uh, very normal. Uh, so when do we suggest uh, gamma knife therapy? Uh, patients who are 65 years and older or are poor surgical candidates and patients with multicentric tumors, uh, RT can be encouraged. There is always a risk of uh, regrowth uh, with these therapies. And there is also a risk of osteoradionecrosis of the temporal bone. However, this risk is low if optimal dose of radiotherapy, which is uh, 35 grays per, uh, for, for three weeks or 45 grays for four weeks is used. Coming to the next lesion, fibro-osseous lesions. So fibrous dysplasia is a very common lesion which we encounter. Fibrous dysplasia uh, is an arrest of bone maturation at the woven stage of uh, development. Another entity is ossifying fibroma, which is a benign neoplasm of the bone in which uh, normal bone architecture is replaced by a tissue composed of collagen fibers, fibroblasts, and various amounts of calcified tissue with the potential for unlimited and destructive growth. Benign fibrosis lesions. Uh, these lesions have been reported uh, to be more common in females and maxilla is the most commonly affected uh, skull bone. Fibrous dysplasia, the term fibrous dysplasia was introduced by uh, Leichenstein in uh, 1938 and it usually arises within the first or second decades of life, manifesting clinically as a very slow growing painless expansion of the involved bone. About 75% of the patients with fibrous dysplasia are diagnosed before the age of 30 and there are two main forms, polyostotic and monostotic. And this uh, fibrous dysplasia is most commonly associated with uh, mccoon albright syndrome. And this syndrome is associated with precocious, uh, uh, precocious puberty, fibrous dysplasia, cafe au lait spots, and polyostotic form of uh, fibrous dysplasia. So this is a disfiguring condition. However, it has a lower rate of malignant transformation. Malignant uh, transformation occurs in about uh, 0.5% of polyostrotic forms and in uh, about 4% of patients in patients with mccoon albright syndrome. Regardless of the number of bones affected, fibrous dysplasia is almost always a unilateral disease and the lesions rarely cross the midline. Active growth of this uh, fibrous dysplasia typically slows or ceases around the time of puberty or after skeletal maturation. However, sometimes sporadic periods of uh, regrowth may occur in adulthood. Diagnosis is mainly by radiography, uh, CT scan, MRI, and biopsy can be done. And the radiological ap appearance varies with the stage of development and the amount of bony matrix within the lesion. Classical fibrous dysplasia has been described as having a ground glass appearance or an orange peel appearance. On MRI, T1 signal is in, uh, intermediate and T2 signal is hypointense. Management is uh, usually conservative and uh, these uh, lesions tend to stabilize over time and have a very low ma malignancy potential. Uh, biophosphonates such as uh, pamidronate uh, have been tried with uh, uh, limited success and they act by inhibiting osteoclastic activity. Surgery is done only for symptomatic lesions or to recontour cosmetic deformities. In the paranasal sinuses, surgery is done via endoscopic technique or an external approach. Radical or complete resection is not necessary in these, case, uh, in these cases. Patients should be followed up with periodic uh, imaging to guide management of any regrowth that may occur. About 25 to 50 percent of all patients will exhibit subsequent uh, regrowth of the lesion and may require multiple shave down procedures. Radiotherapy is contraindication because of the risk of malignant transformation and the possible side effects of facial skeleton growth. 
because this lesion is usually seen before the second uh, decade of life, so it is usually not advisable to give radiotherapy. Uh, Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is the most common sarcoma of the temporal bone and it is almost exclusively seen in children. And the most common histological type is embryonal and 20% are metastatic at presentation. And they are thought to arise from the middle ear mesenchymal cells, but also from the eustachian tube. They most commonly present with otoria and hearing loss and advanced lesions may present with facial palsy and abducens palsy if the petrous uh, apex is also involved. Staging uh, follows guidelines, uh, same as uh, other rhabdomyosarcomas. Grade 1 is localized disease, totally resected. Grade 2 is residual microscopic disease. Grade 3 is gross residual disease. And grade 4 is when distant metastasis is present. Complete resection is usually difficult. Triple modality treatment is the mainstay in which uh, three uh, agent chemotherapy is given along with uh, radiotherapy and surgery. Uh, some of the other sarcomas are Ewing sarcoma, Saustogenic sarcoma, Condro sarcoma, and Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is almost always uh, associated with uh, HIV and AIDS, and it usually involves the extranotric canal and the middle ear. Endolymphatic sac tumors are quite rare, and they're associated with one nipple and uh, Lindos uh, disease, and they are papillary in nature and very vascular. Posterior fossa involvement is also very common since it is very closely associated to the with the endolymphatic sac. And the patients usually present with hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, and facial palsy. Other benign lesions are glandular uh, tumors. Uh, these are uh, primary adenomatous tumors. These are quite rare and may arise from mucosal glands in the middle ear. And they present as a mass behind the tympanic membrane with extensive bony erosion on the CT. And the mainstay of treatment is by surgery. Carcinoid tumors are uh, even more rare and it is treated with surgery. Some other uh, benign lesions are granulomas and uh, dystrophies, eosinophilic uh, granuloma and Paget disease, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, temporal bone may also be involved in case of uh, lymphoma and leukemia. Primary disease is uh, very rare in case of temporal bone, but uh, lymphomas may present with hearing loss and facial palsy and they can be accompanied with uh, by a uh, mass or otoria and uh, leukemics usually present with uh, tumor infiltration or hemorrhage and there is involvement of labyrinth resulting in sudden sensory neural hearing loss and vestibular symptoms. Cholesterol of uh, Peter's apex is uh, something we come across quite regularly and the treatment is through uh, the complete removal of the matrix and try to preserve the patient whenever possible and uh, a good seal of the CSF. So this is an interesting case uh, of uh, uh, a Peter's apex uh, cholestoma, which was operated at the Bangalore Skull Base Institute. As you can see here, the right ear is involved and you can see the disease extending right up to the uh, Peter's apex here, quite an extensive disease. And uh, as always, uh, a wide incision is taken posterior to the pinna and uh, the mucoperichondrial uh, layer has been uh, elevated and a blind sac closure is first done. You can see the disease here completely. Uh, wide uh, cortical mastoidectomy also has been done. The tympanic membrane is intact, which is often the case in congenital cholestomas. And here, if you see this uh, extensive disease here, ex uh, going up to the petrous apex. So you can see the cholestatoma completely filling the uh, middle ear, going near the epitympanum and extending up to the petrous apex here. And here now the disease has been completely cleared. You can see it is sticking quite close to the middle cranial fossa, uh, 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 fossa dura. And after the disease clearance, the cavity is sealed with uh, fat and completely sutured in layers. And you can see complete disease clearance here on the right side. And this is the uh, post-operative facial nerve picture. Malignant tumors of the temporal bone can be from the pinna, extranotary canal or the middle ear. Uh, tumors of the pinna can be epidermal tumors. And in this, the squamous cell carcinomas are most common and they constitute about 45% of pinna tumors. 
they can uh, metastasize to the parotid gland, gyblodigastric nodes, posterior cervical uh, nodes, and uh, metastasis is seen in about 15% of the cases. Treatment is by surgery or radiation. Other tumors of the pinna include basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, sebaceous carcinoma, and all these are also treated with surgery because they are considered to be radioresistant. And as I was saying, squamous cell uh, carcinoma is the most common and uh, they present with bloody otoria and otalgia. And uh, signs and symptoms include lateral lesions of the cartilaginous canal, which can spread through fissures of Santorini to, into the preauricular sinus. And these lesions may be associated with chronic inflammation of the extraordinary canal or cholestoma. Treatment options include uh, on-block uh, resection of the extraordinary canal, the tympanic membrane, the parotid, and uh, whatever other uh, areas are involved. And also they may require radiotherapy after the surgical clearance. TNM staging, T1 is when the tumor is limited to the extraordinary canal without bony erosion or soft tissue extension. T2 is when the tumor uh, has limited uh, extraordinary canal bony erosion or less than 0.5 centimeter soft tissue involvement. In T3, tumor erodes the osseous uh, extraordinary canal with more than 0.5 uh, centimeter soft tissue involvement or tumor involving middle ear or mastoid or presenting with facial opacity. T4 is extensive disease eroding the cochlea, petrous apex, medial wall of the middle ear, carotid canal, jugular foramen, dura, and more than 0.5 centimeter of soft tissue involvement. Squamous cell carcinoma can be treated by lateral temporal bone resection, uh, uh, subtotal uh, temporal bone resection, and total temporal bone resection. Carotid management is also very important because temporal bone resection requires carotid control as the vessel passes medial to the eustachian tube before entering the cavernous sinus. So we are working in very close proximity to the carotid. So it is very important to manage the carotid. Uh, so CT will show if the tumor is uh, close to the carotid canal and four vessel angiography is a very useful tool to check if the vessel is involved with the tumor. So we can do what is called as a balloon occlusion testing with uh, xenon and uh, do a CT. So this is done to investigate the uh, collateral blood flow to the ipsilateral hemisphere. About 80% of the patients will tolerate uh, internal carotid artery sacrifice and 10% will not. And this necessitates prior bypass grafting uh, before temporal bone resection. About 10% of the patients are uh, in the gray zone uh, that is intraoperative or preoperative revascularization may be needed. Lateral temporal bone resection involves on-block removal of the entire extraordinary canal and the tympanic membrane, and it uses the extended facial recess approach. It may also include parotidectomy, neck dissection, and mandibular condylectomy, depending on the extent of the disease. And it involves resection of the concha and may include variable parts of the pinna and the tradus. So some of the steps involved in this procedure are closure of the extraordinary canal, complete mastoidectomy, extended facial recess uh, we, where we sacrifice the corda, so in uh, facial recess approach, the corda is preserved, but when you go uh, further uh, distally, uh, you, you do what is called the extended facial recess approach, where you sacrifice the corda, but you get a uh, wider exposure, and so it is easier to clear the disease. So after that, you disarticulate the incurious epidial joint, fracture the anterior extraordinary canal, just lateral to the eustachian tube with an osteotome, and always remember to watch out for the internal carotid artery. Subtotal temporal bone resection is done if the tumor has penetrated into the middle ear space or the mastoid cavity and it requires resection of the otic capsule. It can be extended towards the infratemporal fossa, jugular bulb or dura as per extent of the tumor. And this procedure should ideally include monitoring of the cranial nerve 7, 9, 10, 11 and uh, all, all steps should be taken to preserve the 7th cranial nerve by completely mobilizing the genitrate ganglion uh, the, uh, mobilizing the nerve from the genitrate ganglion up to the stylomastoid foramen and we can transpose the nerve posteriorly. In subtotal uh, uh, temporal bone resection, again, the tegmen and the posterior fossa plates are thinned and then removed. Uh, Translabyrinthine drill out of the intraoretic canal and jugular bulb is done. This allows for the mobilization of the patient you know, from the porous if required. And the transacted end of the seventh cranial nerve should be sent for frozen section. 
the entire tympanic ring is drilled out, leaving a uh, periosteum over the uh, internal carotid artery and the lower cranial nerves. Neck dissection is also uh, performed for vascular control of the internal jugular and internal carotid artery. And involvement of jugular foramen necessitates internal jugular sacrifice and ligation of the sigmoid sinus. Dural extension can be resected and the dural defect can be closed and extension into the um, uh, infratemporal fossa can be accomplished by including fish A infratemporal fossa approach. Total temporal bone resection is used if the tumor involves the petrous apex and it mandates proximal and distal control of the ICA. And uh, distal control is accomplished with middle cranial fossa approach and it requires division of the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves. So what are the outcomes? Tumors limited to the external artery canal have a 50 to 80% cure rate after uh, a temporal bone resection, lateral temporal bone resection. Tumors extending beyond the middle ear uh, have a 0 to 15% survival after two years and survival increases with dual modality therapy. Uh, University of Pittsburgh staging system, increasing T stage is inversely proportional to survival and T1 and T2 have reported 100% two year survival. T3 lesions have two year survival of 56% and two year survival of four, uh, T4 tumors are 17%. In benign or low-grade neoplasms such as cholecystoma, schwannoma, chondroma, meningioma, uh, these should be removed totally to prevent a recurrence. So ITF uh, approaches the Peters apex. Type A or type B fish approach can be done. Uh, this gives a better exposure to the uh, tumor. It helps in control of the internal carotid artery. And uh, combined with the middle cranial fossa, retrosigmoid, transcochlear, or uh, the translabyrinthine uh, roots. Combination of the uh, transcochlear or translabyrinthine root with posterior translocation of the patient now offers the best access to the Peters apex. Some of the complications which can be encountered are hemorrhage, which can be massive, and this may lead to other complications as well. And uh, there can also be air embolism, which is quite rare. Post-operatively, there can be CSF leakage if the uh, cavity is not completely sealed. There can be meningitis. Again, if there is a continuous CSF leak, there may be retrograde uh, spread of infection into the meninges. Lower cranial nerve deficits and cerebrovascular complications. So this was a brief overview on the uh, lesions of the temporal bone. Thank you.